I know some of you are anxious to review your exams. I'll have my regular office hours tomorrow, um, and I'll start making appointments to review it, the exams next week if you have legitimate reasons that you can't come by during my office hours. And I've also extended the time to review it um, by one week. Okay. So what we're going to do today is we're going to finish up Chapter 12, which is on DNA replication, and then get started into Chapter 13, which covers another very important area of DNA metabolism, transcription, which is basically RNA synthesis. But before we get started with that, let's start with our usual two questions. So here's the first one from uh, the last lecture. Since this one's worth 10 points, um, I'll tell you that uh, only 28% have it right. So now you have to question yourself. Why do you do that? Because I like to live life on the edge. That's how I live vicariously through your stress. <laughs> I'll go to two minutes since it's the first one, get everybody settled. Uh, now we're up to 40%. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So what do you think the answer is? I like it. I keep it. This is just a very important point. Will this be on the exam? Probably. The DNA polymerases all require a primer, but the RNA polymerases do not. Okay. We're going to come back to that numerous times. Okay, let's try uh, this one, this one. Oh, I gotta, I gotta start there. <laughs> oh. Two people have C, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to see what you do with it. <laughs> oh, maybe that's, oh, okay, I forgot that you guys do that. You just hit something to make sure you clocked in. All right. We'll go to... We've got a one minute on this. Looks like a few more coming in. Yeah. All right, three, two, one. Just right. curious. Let's see. Uh, oh, good. At least most of you knew. Okay, we'll come back to that a little bit later. I'll explain this one a little bit later. Uh, why this is at least my feeling that this is the one legitimate case where cells actually have a reverse transcriptase activity. Okay. 
All right. So we're doing this chapter on DNA replication and recombination. As I said before, I, do you still have in your notes at the very end some slides about the holiday junction and the molecular basis for recombination, or did I take those out? They'll be right at the end. Okay. So if there's extra slides that you have when we get to the end here, I left them in there because I wasn't sure if that was a topic that's covered on the MCAT or not. Um, but we're only going to cover what we're going to cover in class, even if there are some extra slides on your handouts. Okay? All right. So we're talking about DNA replication, so let's kind of back up a little bit to where we were last time. So this is a diagram of a replication bubble. Where did DNA synthesis start? Right here at the origin, and it goes bi-directionally. So replication, so there's actually two, the DNA strands are replicating in two opposite directions. This, will, this model comes from E. coli, so they basically start in OREC, go around the circle, and terminate 180 degrees further. So you got, this is the replication bubble. So it's moving out and unwinding in both directions, as it's showing there. And what you have is the leading strand is over here and up here, and the lagging strands are here and here. Okay. Now, could you... Let's see. If we erased all the five primes, the three primes, and all everything else, and I just you just had this light gray, the template, whatever it is, would you know? Could you determine which was the leading and which was the lagging? If all the indicate, if everything else was all the you know the five prime, the three prime, everything else was taken off, could you tell? No, not really. Because whether it's the leading or the lagging strand depends on which way the polarity is going on the template. So you have to know. Now, if you know that the top strand here is 5 prime and this one's 3 prime, can you work everything else out? Yes, yes that's all the information you need. Okay, so since this is the template strand going 5 prime to 3 prime left to right, then synthesis has to go opposite that direction because it always goes 5 prime to 3 prime and the strands are anti-parallel. So synthesis is going to go right to left and since that's going, since synthesis is going in the same direction that the replication bubble is unwinding, that's the leading strand. As far as we can tell, that's made in one continuous DNA strand from the origin all the way to the termination point. Then in the opposite corner will be the other leading strand because the strands are anti-parallel. So now this one is going three, the template is three prime to five prime going left to right. So the leading strand can go five prime to three prime in the direction that the bubble. So the DNA that's being synthesized in the same direction that the bubble's unwinding will be the leading strand. The opposite will be the lagging strand with these so-called Okasaki fragments. Okay, so just a few little reviews from last time. So Ori C, so this is like the centromere in the sense that this is a DNA sequence. This is the DNA sequence on the E. coli genome where the initiator proteins initially bind. So their whole function is to bind that particular DNA sequence and to begin to unwind the strands. That initiates the DNA synthesis. From there, the DNA helicases take over, and they do exactly what their name makes it sound like. They unwind the helix. So the helicases are going to unwind uh, the DNA where the initiator protein started the job. But those complementary single strands want to come back together. Remember, they're more stable if those bases are complementary and you have the double-stranded structure, so to keep them from reforming the double-stranded structure, they become coated with the single-strand binding proteins. These proteins have no enzymatic activity. I think of them like a molecular doorstop. They are there to coat the single-stranded DNA to keep it from forming its double-stranded structure at least long enough for DNA synthesis to happen. They function, as we said last time, as a tetramer. So there are four copies of this protein coordinately function together. 
and they literally code or bind to the single-stranded DNA, covering about 35 to 65 base pairs of DNA. The other, another key enzyme is the, top, the DNA gyrase, which is a topoisomerase. So it can help relax the supercoiling that's being generated by the unwinding of the helix. So DNA gyrase is an essential enzyme. A mutation in the DNA gyrase would, gyrase would be lethal because the DNA can't replicate. Once the DNA gets unwound to a certain point, the superhelical tension is so great the whole system just shuts down. Okay. So we got the helix open. We got it available. Now we just have to initiate DNA synthesis. This is that key point. All known DNA polymerases require a primer. Even the reverse transcriptase, even though it's a special type of DNA polymerase, because it uses RNA as a template, still requires a primer. This is important for a couple of reasons. One is we'll talk about why it's important for a high level of fidelity in DNA replication. But the other is we do a lot of DNA synthesis reactions in the laboratory. The polymerase chain reaction, for instance, DNA sequencing. All of these use DNA polymerases. Well, if we're going to use them in the laboratory, we have to replicate what's happening in the cell so we have to provide primers for those reactions. So the main point is, I kind of think of it like a molecular trailer hitch. The DNA polymerase needs a, a double-stranded structure with a three prime hydroxyl. So these primers are short. They don't have to be very long. I mean, it could be maybe 10 or 12 nucleotides. But you need this stable double-stranded structure with a three prime hydroxyl and that is where the DNA polymerase can form the phosphodiester bond with the first nucleotide. So, in E. coli, there is an enzyme called the primase. So, usually a giveaway, you hear ASE, ACE at the end of something tells you it's an enzyme. Would this be a DNA or RNA polymerase? This is an RNA polymerase. Now, when we get to chapter 13, I'm going to tell you that in E. coli, there's only one RNA polymerase. And it makes all the RNAs in the cell except these primers. So this is a RNA polymerase, but its sole purpose is to make these short primers used during DNA synthesis. And that's what gives the 3' hydroxyl for the DNA polymerase. Okay. Would this work with DNA primers? Actually, I don't know if anybody's done it in vivo in the cells, but in the laboratory, it's actually more common to use DNA primers than to use RNA primers. Okay. So in the laboratory in vitro, the enzymes don't seem to care just as long as they have that double-stranded structure with a 3' hydroxyl. In vivo, in the cell, it's going to be an RNA primer. Now, this starts to make things complicated. Because RNA in DNA is highly mutagenic, very unstable. And when we get to the chapter on DNA repair, we'll talk about there's a whole set of DNA repair systems that are looking for RNA in the DNA structure and removing it. So these primers are all going to have to be removed at a later point. Okay. So we got the leading and the lagging strand. Just to reiterate, as far as we can tell on the leading strand, DNA synthesis is continuous, so there's really just one primer needed for the leading strand. However, on the lagging strand, you have this multitude of short little Okasaki fragments, and every single one of those will require a primer, and every one of those primers will have to be removed. Okay. So to make it a little bit complicated, there's five DNA polymerases that are known in E. coli. They have the very imaginative names of DNA polymerase one through five. Okay. The two main ones that we're going to focus on are DNA polymerase one and DNA polymerase three. 
The other polymerases are involved in DNA repair. We're not going to go too much into the enzymology of recombination, but we've got a whole chapter on DNA repair. And what you see is DNA, re there's enzymes that do multiple cross, I guess it's like cross training. The same enzymes function in DNA replication, they function in DNA repair, and they also function in genetic recombination. So there's a lot of crosstalk between these different pathways utilizing the same enzymes. Okay. DNA polymerase 3 is the major DNA polymerase responsible for making, synthesizing the leading strand and the Okasaki fragments. All right. It's a large multimeric protein complex. What does that mean? Multimeric is telling you what? Are all enzymes a single polypeptide? What's hemoglobin? What's hemoglobin? You have two alpha globin polypeptides and two beta globins. So hemoglobin is four, is a tetramer, in the sense that it's four different polypeptides with the porphyrin rim, ring system all coming together. So multimeric means it's a multiple polypeptides coming together. Some enzymes, for instance, will find DNA polymerase one is a single polypeptide. But DNA polymerase 3 is larger. It has multiple subunits. As I said, it's the major DNA polymerase. And it has two enzymatic activities. So you've got to follow with me here because it's going to get a little confusing. They all are based on the, the direction of action that they have. So it is a 5' prime to 3' prime polymerase. Do any DNA polymerases have a 3' prime to 5' prime polymerase activity. If you found one, there's probably a Nobel Prize in it for you, okay, because nobody's, these have been around for about 50 years and nobody's found one yet. So the polymerase always goes 5' prime to 3' prime, but it's also an exonuclease. A nuclease is telling you what, what is the enzyme doing? That's degrading the DNA. Exonuclease is telling you it comes is coming in from the ends of the molecule. So the restriction enzymes are endonucleases, which mean they cut internally in the DNA. So exonuclease means it's clipping along from the end of the molecule, and it's going in a five prime to three prime direction. Now, does this make sense? You're synthesizing the DNA in one direction, and then you have a an exonuclease that can Remove it. Okay. Make sense? And black is white and white is black. And finally. Okay. Doesn't make sense, does it? Okay. One, all these polymerases will have these exonuclease act activities, but the polymerase is always more active than the exonuclease. So the polymerase will always win the race. The second is, this is a proofreading activity. So at the very beginning of this chapter, I told you that DNA replication is this highly precise process with an error frequency of probably around one in a billion nucleotides, or about one in 10 to the ninth nucleotides is incorporated by, makes a mistake. But there are no enzyme systems that are that precise. So it gets there by a couple of proofreading steps. What this is going to do is if the nucleotide has a mismatch, there's a G in the template, it's supposed to put a C, um, but in fact it puts in a T, something like that. If it catches that mistake, then the exonuclease can remove it and the polymerase can try again. So it's an editing function that allows it to remove mismatch bases and then try again. Okay. The other is DNA polymerase 3 is said to be highly processive. What we mean by processive is the same complex, RNA polymerase complex, that starts the DNA synthesis at that primer, at OREC, is as far as we can tell the same complex that terminates it. So a processive enzyme catalyzes repeated rounds of whatever its process is, but it's the same complex. As opposed to non-processive, 
the complex would come on, add a nucleotide, fall off. Another one would come on, add a nucleotide. So by processive means, it can synthesize DNA for very long tracks. All right. And so, as far as we can tell, if that leading strand is made continuously in an E. coli complex, this same polymerase complex is going a little over 2 million base pairs to get this job done. So any questions before I make it more complicated? Because you know I like to do that. Yes? Yes. This one goes three prime to five prime. So to be clear, the polymerase will always be going five prime to three prime. Three prime to five prime means, since it's an exonuclease, it can literally remove the DNA that was just polymerized. So the polymerase can go this way, and the exonuclease is going in the opposite direction. And that's because it's a proofreading activity. If at a certain frequency the polymerase makes a mistake when it's pairing the bases. If it makes that mistake, this exonuclease can remove the mistake, and the polymerase can try again. So that's why you have an exonuclease that's going opposite the direction that the polymerase is going. Okay? Yes? This activity is associated with this whole complex. It's actually, it's actually part of one of the subunits that's here. Are there lots of different exonucleases? Is that what you're asking? Well, isn't it, so that's a part of the lagging strand, and it's the <laughs> Well, it's actually going to be needed to, this exonuclease is there for proofreading activity. It's not going to be actually involved in removing the primers. So its function is, the polymerase is going along, as we said, what was it? 2,000 nucleotides per second in E. coli, and it makes a mistake in the base pairing. It catches that mistake, and then the exonuclease removes that nucleotide, and then the polymerase tries again. Okay? So once you got that figured out, to make it more confusing, the first DNA polymerase to be purified was called DNA polymerase 1. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So Arthur Kornberg won the Nobel Prize for purifying this enzyme. I think I may have mentioned that he did this. I was told he started with about, uh, about a kilogram of E. coli paste. So if you've done if you've sent if you've worked with E. coli in the micro lab and you get a little pellet of cells, just sort of scale that up to about a kilogram or so. And that's what he started with to purify the enzyme. It's an unusual and a special enzyme. It has the same two activities as DNA polymerase three. It's a five prime to three prime polymerase and a 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease. But actually, so if well, what happened was when he purified this enzyme, they realized, once they analyzed it in the lab, that it, it actually wasn't fast enough to be the main DNA polymerase, and that's why it turned out to be DNA polymerase 3. So why did he probably get this enzyme purified first instead of DNA polymerase 3? Yeah, it's, it's more abundant. So they were just assaying for DNA polymerase activity, and this was the first one they found. He thought it was the main one until they did some calculations on how fast it can polymerize and realized it's not fast enough. It, this enzyme isn't fast enough to replicate the whole chromosome in 20 minutes, and that's why they started looking for other ones. But when they looked at the enzyme activity, it's also unique in that it has it's a 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease. So it has both exonuclease activities. It can chew in from the 3' prime end, and it can chew in from the 5' prime end. Which one is coming from the 5' prime end? This one. So these are always in directionality of the enzyme action. 
So a five prime to three prime exonuclease means it's chewing away the DNA beginning on the five prime end and chewing towards the three prime end. Exo meaning it's coming in right from the ends of the molecule. Yes. So if you only have five prime nucleases, yes. then it can keep three prime five prime and three prime nucleases. Well, this isn't going to be turned out to be proofreading activity. This this activity is what's going to remove the prime. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. So this is an unusual enzyme because it has the same two activities. It's DNA polymerase 3, but it has this third activity, which is an exonuclease that goes in the opposite direction. So this enzyme can actually degrade the DNA from both ends. So if I took this enzyme, if I took a piece of double-stranded DNA, incubated it with this enzyme without any nucleotide triphosphates, primers, anything else, what would happen to my, theoretically, if I had enough enzyme there, what's going to happen to my DNA? going to get degraded down to just mononucleotides because it can degrade it from both directions. Okay. So as I said, this 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease, and I'll give you a more detail on this, this is what's needed to remove the primers and is critical for being able to join the Okasaki fragments into one continuous strand of DNA. The other is, and as I said, these enzymes do cross duties. DNA polymerase 1 plays into a lot of DNA repair systems. So the same exonuclease is going to be involved in the DNA repair. So what we'll see when we get to DNA repair, the big challenge is finding the problem. All right? You live in a little bit older house. You've got a little wooden porch on the back. One of the boards is rotted. You step out one morning, and your foot goes right through the floor. You identified the problem, right? You repair it by re basically removing the rotted wood and a little bit of good wood and put down new wood. Well, the DNA repair works the same way. The challenge is finding the damage, but the repair process is basically remove the damaged DNA and just replace it with new DNA. And DNA polymerase 1 is going to play into a lot of those. We'll come back to that more in a later chapter. Okay. And the last enzyme we're going to talk about is the DNA ligase. The polymerases can, are the polymerases forming phosphodester bonds? What is the bond that joins nucleotides together? They're making a phosphodester bond. But they can only do that if they have a nucleotide triphosphate precursor that they're adding on to the DNA. When you have two, if you have double-stranded DNA already in place, but you have a, a nick, a broken phosphodiester bond, the polymerases cannot catalyze that reaction. The enzyme that does that is DNA ligase. So when all these Okasaki fragments need to get joined together, the polymerase can't make that last phosphodiester bond. That's where DNA ligase is going to come in. But I'll show you that in a step-by-step. -step. All right. So let's try this question before we get into that. Now, in contrast to that earlier question, it looks like about 90% of you are getting this one right. I guess the other 12 students are just now waking up. All right, we'll just, I'll go to one minute on this one. So this one is D, right? Yeah. All right? Let's just give you a little break. Okay. So just to kind of walk you through this process again, 
So we have the origin of replication. That's where the initiator proteins are binding. They begin to unwind. The helicase right here is unwinding the DNA. Then the primase is making the little primer. I think that's what all of this is telling you. And now the replication bubble is going bidirectionally, so it's moving in both directions. And then you have the lagging strand synthesis here and here, and this little lighter color, green, whatever it is. That's the little primer. Then you have the Okasaki fragment. But what you end up with is you have these short fragments. You've got a little short piece of RNA, and you've even got some gaps between the Okasaki fragments. All right. What's going to happen if, if this DNA stays, stays like this? What's going to happen at the next round of replication? Things are going to start to fall apart. If this starts to unwind, it's going to fall apart. So these primers have to be removed. The gaps between the Okazaki fragments have to be filled in. And the bonds have to phosphodiester bond between adjoining Okazaki fragments has to be formed. Those three steps are needed before the lagging strand can be converted into a single continuous piece of DNA, just like the leading strand. Okay. So here's the focus of our attention right now, is how do we go from, how do we take care of this? We've got a gap between two adjacent Okazaki fra fragments. We've got this primer, and we need to join these two fragments together with a phosphodiester bond. So the enzyme, as I said, that does that is going to be the DNA polymerase 1. This is where that 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease comes in. So the polymerase, all right, so which direction is synthesis going on this diagram? Right to left, you're right to left or left to right? Oh, that's a usual split vote again. Okay, it has to go 5' prime to three prime, so the lower strand is being synthesized. The upper strand is the template. So here's, which, which was made first? This Okasaki fragment or this one? The one over here on the left. So now DNA polymerase three made this and it stops here, so we got a gap of some number of nucleotides, and then we have this primer. So now DNA polymerase 1 starts synthesizing DNA at this 3' prime hydroxyl. And what it's doing is because it's got this 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease, the exonuclease is moving in the same direction as the polymerase. So it chews away the primer so it extends out the Okasaki fragment until the polymerase runs into the RNA primer. DNA polymerase 3 can't go any further, but DNA polymerase 1 can now use that 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease to chew away the primer and replace it with DNA. So that's what it's showing you here. DNA is being added and RNA is being removed. So you fill in the gap and all you have is that NIC that we've talked about before, which is you need a, these are two adjacent nucleotides and you need a phosphodiester bond between the two of them. The polymerase cannot catalyze that reaction. There you need DNA ligase. And we have to do, we actually, and so we do the same thing in the lab. We'll join two pieces of DNA together by complementary hydrogen bonding, but we need to make them into a continuous piece of DNA. So we'll use DNA ligase for that purpose. Okay? So once you fill in the gaps, remove the RNA primer, and then ligate them together, then the lagging strand is now one continuous piece of DNA. And all of this in E. coli has to get done in about 20 minutes. Not impressed. Okay. Let's try this one.
Okay. Okay. So the vast majority of, getting, of you are getting this wrong. And it's because you're going to accuse me of just telling you this a little bit. Rethink, read carefully what I'm saying there. You're going to accuse me of being too picky, too tricky. Okay. But the devil's in the detail. As I've told some of you before, when I'm you're standing over me and ready to do my quadruple bypass surgery, I want you to know everything. I don't want you to know kind of like, well, I wasn't there that day, so I don't, I'm not sure where those arteries go. But you've got to sweat the detail. Oh, now 24% have it right. Okay. Managed to get to 10% of you. Do what? We have to finish sometime this afternoon. All right. I'll go to two minutes, and then I'll explain. All right. So... Um, Actually, the answers are pretty much equally split between A, D, and E. Okay. What does the helicase do? First of all, is A correct? No. What is A? Those are the initiator proteins. The helicase can't start that. The helicase breaks the hydrogen bonds because the helicase unwinds the DNA. It unwinds the DNA by breaking the hydrogen bonds. Okay. Which enzyme would be C? That would be the gyrates. And for B would be that would be the single strand binding proteins. Okay. All right. Let's try again. All over the map again. Hmm. Yeah, I'll go to one minute on this one. Okay. So what's the answer? There you go. All right. Okay, so a few more comments about, this is what I was talking about, that proofreading activity. So as I said, overall error frequency of DNA sets this, oh, yes. I'm sorry, why what? And not... Because it's not part of the enzyme. That says that's part of the enzyme. <coughs> no. The primase makes the primer, which then provides the free prime hydroxyl, so that the DNA polymerase can use it for synthesis. This says that the three prime hydroxyl group is actually part of the primase enzyme. Okay, makes sense? Oh, reading's a bitch. <laughs> All right. So, as I, I've said several times, these enzyme systems are not precise enough. 
Your error frequency is way too high to ever get anywhere close to 10 to the minus 9 type of error frequency. Basically, probably, um, well, okay, it's got it here, forgot. The pairing process, the DNA polymerase putting the right base on compared to the template is pretty good. It makes a mistake about once out of every 100,000, okay? So that's 10 to the minus fifth. But that's four orders of magnitude too sloppy and would actually be too high an error frequency and would in induce too many mutations. And we probably all wouldn't, we wouldn't be here for this lecture because we'd all be dead by now. So to help get that down a little bit lower is this proofreading activity. So that's where this three prime to five prime exonuclease comes in. I don't think I don't have a diagram of it, but what's really envisioned based on X-ray crystallography of the enzyme is the DNA is really going. Think of it almost like a tunnel. That there's a tunnel through the enzyme, and the width of that tunnel is is very precise. And if the bases get mispaired. It causes the system to jam up. The truck was just a little too high for the overpass, and it didn't quite make it. All right? That momentary hesitation in the polymerase moving forward allows the exonuclease to remove the base. Then the polymerase can try again, and if it gets the right base, then synthesis continues. And this reduces the error frequency by about another hundredfold. So now you're Getting it, you're at a point of being about one in ten to the seventh base pairs. Not in this chapter, but in the DNA repair chapter, there's a third level or a second level of proofreading called the mismatch repair. And this occurs after the DNA synthesis happens. If there's still a mismatch, the system goes in, fixes that. That adds about another hundredfold to the accuracy of the system, and that's how you get to ten to the minus ninth but you have to do it in this stepwise process. So you have the original polymerase pairing, you have the exonuclease proofreading, and this mismatch repair system. The mismatch repair system, that's all I'm going to say about it for now. We'll get come back to that when we do the chapter on DNA repair. Okay. Just a few comments on eukaryotic DNA replication. Overall, it's basically the same process, but it's more complicated. It's got more players. You do have chromatin, you got more proteins, you got the nucleosomes, this sort of thing. But a couple of the key differences are going to be, first, it's much greater size. We've talked about that numerous times and how it uses multiple origins of replication in order to replicate that DNA in a reasonable amount of time. Also because the actual process of replicating the DNA is at least an order of magnitude slower. The DNA is linear instead of circular. That's going to create a problem that we're going to have to talk about in a minute. Okay. So we talked about how eukaryotic chromosomes have to use thousands of origins of replication to basically be initiating DNA synthesis almost simultaneously. I say almost because there is levels of regulation. Not all origins have to be used every time. But the the main thing I just want to talk about here is how does the cell know whether that one origin has been used or not? Because we've already talked about how cells don't like extra DNA or too little DNA. So what you really want to do is use each origin once and no more than once. Okay, And it does this through a process called licensing. Basically, it's just a protein that associates with each origin before it's utilized. Then, when those initiator proteins and DNA replication begins, it displaces that protein. Now the, the origin is unlicensed. So this protein basically marks for the cell which origins have been used and which origins have not been used. And it's thought that this is how the system helps to control to make sure all the DNA gets replicated without some origins getting used more than once or some parts of the DNA being missed. About the only other one comment I want to make on is just there are the eukaryotic DNA polymerases. They've used Greek letters to distinguish them from the Roman numerals used for the bacterial system. 
The enzymes are a little bit different. I'll just give you a couple of examples. For instance, DNA polymerase alpha. This one's different in that it's the primase, but it also makes the first little bit of DNA. So it's actually synthesizing both RNA and DNA through the same enzyme complex. So technically, this would be both a DNA and an RNA polymerase. Uh, polymerase uh, delta, probably a pretty close analog to what DNA polymerase 1 is doing in E. coli. Uh, epsilon, DNA replication on the leading strand, gammas in the mitochondria. Beta seems to be more involved in genetic recombination and such. And there's at least 10 other ones. Okay? If you want to memorize the other 10 from table 12.5, that's fine with me. Okay. The important, but what you do see here is kind of like a government bureaucracy. The cell's doing the same thing, but it takes 15 enzymes in eukaryotic cells to do what E. coli does with two. There's lots and lots of other examples. The other is, what's unique in the eukaryotic cells that we don't have to think about in the prokaryotic cells, is we also have to have the nucleosomes. So this is another reason why replication of eukaryotic DNA is slower, because you have to make, the histones have to be expressed. So not surprisingly, the only time histone proteins are made in the cell is during S phase. They have to be assembled, the DNA has to be assembled with it. So the question was, we have this nucleosome. It's got how many proteins? There's eight, so there's two copies of each of four histones. What do the new histones look like? I mean, the new nucleosomes, are they all new or old? or what's, How are they put together? Is there some special way they get partitioned apart? Basically, all the data says the old histones are just disassembled. There's new histones being made. They just get pulled from the bin as they need them, and that the new, the new histones are basically just random mixtures of old, the old previous new histones and the newly synthesized one. So they're just sort of randomly put together. Uh, this is just another electron micrograph of showing you. This is that beads on a string that was first, that's how they came up with the idea they could see these little beads, each of those little beads are the nucleosomes. Um, the other last comment on this is just sort of our changing ideas of how cells are structured. Um, for a long time, cell biologists thought that the cytoplasm was just kind of this soup of all these different molecular molecules and they were just kind of randomly distributed. We now know there's a very precise cytoskeleton in there and little molecular motors and pretty much a little cable system that transports molecules through there. Well, the nucleus has something very similar. It's got a, a matrix inside it. And in many cases, the, we've, there's pretty good data. The chromosomes are actually, they're not randomly distributed in there. They're actually located in very specific places. And so in general, that maybe it was easier to conceptualize, it was thought that the DNA polymerase would be moving along the DNA. What it looks like more likely now is, at least in eukaryotic cells, is the polymerase is anchored in place and basically pulls the DNA through it. So that's all I want you to get away from that is that this idea that it's probably the polymerase is anchored in place and the template is what's actually being moved. Yes? Yes. Right. So kind of like, you know, maybe it's, you know, you're some kind of a recycling plant. So you got some old parts and you got some new parts and you're just pulling them off the shelves and you're just getting whatever comes along. And so they're just randomly put together. Okay. So that gave me an idea for this question.
Okay, about a third of you think about this. Let's just jump at the first answer you saw. We'll go to one minute. Okay, so if we try to think about how the nucleosomes are assembled, think about it in the models for DNA replication. Which one fits the best? Because it's a randomization. You're breaking it apart. And that's exactly what the dispersive model was, that the DNA would be broken down and then reassembled with old pieces and new pieces put together. See, I was afraid it was going to be too easy because we're sitting here talking about it. Okay. All right. So here's another problem that the cells face. Circular molecules don't have this problem, replicating the end of the molecule. So the circular genomes in prokaryotic cells don't have to deal with the problem that we have here. In eukaryotic cells, the DNA in the chromosome is linear, and because of the requirement for primers and because the polymerase only goes in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, it actually creates a problem with repairing the ends of the molecule. So here's what I mean by that. So here's the leading, here's everything we've been looking at. We're getting out to the end of the molecule. We get here, and we can remove there are enzymes in the cell that can remove this Okasaki. So we've got to remove this Okasaki fragment right here. We can remove this, but there's no 3' prime hydroxyl down here, so we can't, there's no polymerase that can fill in this gap. Now, if, if there was such a polymerase that was 3' prime to 5' prime, then you could go left or right, fill in the gap, and you'd be done. But no such enzyme has been found. So the question was, there's going to be on a linear molecule, there's going to be this single-stranded DNA. That's not stable in cells. The cells can remove this and make this a blunt-ended, double-stranded molecule. But as we talked about before, then the <coughs> cell generation of the molecule is going to get shorter and shorter. So the question is, there that and we also knew that these Single, these double-stranded ends like this are not stable in cells. So there had to be something special about the structure of the ends of the molecule. And that's what led to the discovery of the telomerase that we've talked about before. Okay. So this is the enzyme complex that I would argue legitimately has reverse transcriptase activity. First of all, it's an enzyme complex, but it's not just protein. It's an RNA protein complex. So it's a DNA polymerase, and its function is it's going to extend. Okay, so here's a three prime hydroxyl. It's going to, ex oops, I'm sorry. Uh, it's going to extend this end. This three prime end can extend right to left, but it needs a template. So the telomerase is going to bind to interact with this end. The RNA in the enzyme complex serves as a template. So now you can synthesize DNA going right to left, right? Yeah. right to left, using this RNA in the complex as a template. Now, does that solve the problem? Does that make the end double stranded? No, but it does it. It extends it out. So now if the cell were to make this a blunt-ended molecule, at least it's a little bit longer. And so these teal, uh, let's see, I think the next diagram shows a little more detail. So here's, here's the RNA template. This is part of the enzyme. So it's complementary to this end. This is why these are repeating sequences, so that it can function over and over again. 
This serves as the template. Here's a three prime hydroxyl. And now it can use the RNA as a template. It makes new DNA going right to left as it's drawn. So it's a reverse transcriptase activity because it's an RNA dependent DNA polymerase. And then it can repeat the cycle. And so this is how you get these multiple repeats of the same short sequence on the telomeres of the chromosomes. Hmm? Go ahead. Oh, you're talking about because reverse transcriptase and HIV is kind of error prone? Yeah, so what if this be similar? Well, it could. Part of that, the error frequency that you see with HIV and reverse transcriptase is because it doesn't have a good proofreading activity. And some people think it's actually part of its mechanism for avoiding it. Because it's, that's why it's constantly changing genetically. Well, let's say the same thing happens here. So the question is, well, when you get some errors here, let's say this is. Let's say this is a sloppy process and that the error frequency of adding the nucleotides correctly is a thousand-fold higher than normal. Would that be a problem? Well, it's right out, right. It's out on the ends of the molecule. There's really nothing biologically important out there. There's no transcription going on. There's no structural genes. And so even if it was a little bit sloppy and made some mistakes here, this whole function of this sequence out here is just to protect the end of the chromosome. So even if it was a little bit sloppy, it probably wouldn't matter. The other is, because this is adding these repeats, the length of these telomeres is very dynamic. And it changes from cell type to cell type. What we generally know is while the cells are actively dividing, the telomerase is active, the telomeres are getting longer, the cells hit that quiescent homeostatic level where they're kind of in a maintenance mode, the telomerase shuts down, then the ends of the chromosome start getting shorter as the exonucleases degrade it. If it gets short enough, it becomes a signal for apoptosis and the cell goes through programmed cell death. But in a lot of... In, um, and, oh, I think it's in the next slide we'll talk about. Okay. So all this is doing is just repeating the process. Now at the end, you still have the single-stranded portion that's going to have to be removed and will be made blunt-ended, but you've made the molecule longer. You've prevented it from getting shorter and shorter and shorter with each round of replication. You buy that? Probably not yet, so okay. Yes? Oh, no, no, that won't, no. I, what he, if I understood what was being asked is the reverse transcriptase from HIV has an inherently high error frequency. And it's because it doesn't have much of a proofreading activity. So if you argue that, well, this, what if this DNA polymerase has the same kind of sloppiness so that it, it's making mistakes when it's pairing up the bases here? And so the fidelity... I picked the numbers, let's say a thousand times worse than normal. Would that really be a problem for the cell? Is, it, is the sequence at these ends, the sequence themselves important? Or is it just this fact that it kind of caps the end of the chromosome and keeps it from getting too short? Because if it gets too short, it's going to get into critical sequences within the DNA. So I would argue that it doesn't really matter whether or not the reverse transcriptase activity associated with this enzyme is highly precise in the way it matches the bases. Because it's not the sequences, but just the fact that the DNA sequences are there to protect the ends of the chromosome. Okay, because there's nothing's going to be transcribed, you're not going to be making messenger RNA. So mutations there would probably be very hard to detect. Okay. All right. So a couple of things that we've talked about before, but um, as we just well we just did now. So the telomerase is active in dividing cells. Then it begins to slow down. The telomeres get shorter. They become on the chromosomes unstable, and then that leads to apoptosis and cell death. 
One area that's really interesting is because of its role in aging and in cancer. So I think I also mentioned before that uh, Dolly the sheep, when uh, I think she was about four or five years old, started to develop arthritis and some old age diseases and conditions. And they, when they started checking her chromosomes, they realized that she basically had old chromosomes. The telomeres were shorter than would be normally expected. Um, to do this a little more in a, a more in a more definitive way, if you take genetically engineered mice where you've knocked out the telomerase, what you find is their telomeres get shorter, faster than normal. They show signs of premature aging. They also have a higher susceptibility to cancer. Um, on the other hand, if you take cells in culture and you engineer them with a transgene so that you have a telomerase gene that's active all the time, those cells grow indefinitely. Yes? Is Dolly from a sheep? Like the original? The original? Okay. If they got the, like, if they got whatever they used to She came from a tissue, it was, okay. So first of all, you guys, anybody in here know who Dolly Parton is? Okay, you know, you've, you've seen old movies or whatever. Okay. So, Dolly the sheep was cloned um, at the Roslyn Institute in Scotland. Her mother was actually a mammary cell in culture. It wasn't a sheep, so it was a culture cell. So, the, the experiment, the purpose of the experiment was to take the nucleus from a, com a completely differentiated cell and ask whether you could de-differentiate it back to the stem cell state, and then take that nucleus and implant it into a surrogate embryo and see if you could get an animal out of that. So basically, it was the first cloning. Uh, if I remember correctly, it took 150 tries to get it to work. Um, I, I've never understood. I'd like to read sometime what the rationale was, because every well-trained cell biologist knows that experiment can't be done. And, you, you know, if a grad student had come in suggesting it to me, I would have sent them back to the basic cell biology class to learn some cell biology. They did it. They de-differentiated the cell under completely artificial conditions in the laboratory. They were manipulating the cell culture medium and basically didn't put the nucleotide precursors into it. So it was kind of an artificial sterile starvation type system, but they got it to work. And since Dolly came from a mammary cell, and Dolly Parton had a certain reputation, they actually asked her if she would approve of them naming the sheep Dolly, so that's the story behind it. You know, now we've gotten more sophisticated at doing that, and these cloning experiments have been done with all kinds of animals. What is it? I, you don't see it too much anymore, but I mean, there were these places that were, you know, you'd, you'd clone your dog, you'd, you know, you'd, Got this 15-year-old dog, and he's just just about you know it's just about time to let go, and you're gonna have her cloned and for fifty thousand dollars, you know. I mean, yeah, I'd take the money, go to the rescue, I'd find a dog to look like her, come back with a puppy, and go here you go, we got it. Um, because the other important thing is, I'm getting off track here, but when you're cloning, and this also applies to Having someone serve as a surrogate mother for you, let's say you have, uh, you, you can't, you have fertility issues and you're going to have a surrogate mother, the intrauterine environment clearly affects the development of the fetus. Identical twins are identical because they're also developing within the same biochemical environment. But if you were to take those two genetically identical embryos and implant them in two different surrogate mothers, they wouldn't look identical. So this is probably why a lot of times in these cloning experiments, the animals that come out don't look like the animal that went in. And so there's more to it than just the genetic basis of it. Okay. But, uh, so did I answer your question as I danced around it? <laughs> but she actually started... It, her, it was initially from the mammary glands of a sheep, but there was a tissue culture cell is where they started the experiment. But would it make a difference if they got it from a younger? Like, I'm trying to think if the 
Um, could be. I don't know. If they, they probably were using cells that have been established in culture. So tissue culture cells, once they're... So when you start out, if you want to, if you take what are called primary cultures, so you take an explant of liver, fibroblast, whatever, when you grow them in culture in the laboratory, you have the primary cultures, and the cells will divide, and depending on the cell type, they'll divide maybe 50 or 60 times, and then they will, most of them will form a confluent monolayer, and then they become what we call contact inhibited when they touch each other. Those are molecular signals that stop the dividing. But the other is they reach senescence. They just, they just die. But then you get little foci of cells kind of piling up on top of each other because they've changed genetically, and now they become immortalized. And if they're using this type of cell, then the genetics of the cell they started with was actually different than if they'd had primary cells from, let's say, a young animal. So it's a good question, but I don't know the answer to that question. But the fact that the cloning's been done now with so many animals and so many times, I'm sure those can do, you know, with a little research we could find out what conditions work the best. Okay. Uh, let's see. So these are just some of the, this is why the telomerase is interesting. As I said, so if you have, if you have mice that have a non-functional telomerase, they age prematurely, they have increased susceptibility to cancers. Tissue culture cells where you flip, flip it around and you express the telomerase continuously. They grow indefinitely in culture. From the cancer side of it, almost all cancer cells that have been looked at have an active telomerase activity. I mean, basically, cancer cells are uncontrolled cell proliferation. So there's a clear link between the telomerases, aging, cancer. And this is a very active area of, of research. Okay, so uh, junior scientist is making, playing in the lab again. So you make a transgenic mouse. The transgenic just means a, a transgenic animal means there's some DNA sequence that I put together in a test tube, and now I've introduced it into the genome of this animal. And this transgenic mouse is going to constitutively produce telomerase. So what do you think will happen? I'll go to one minute on this one. Okay. No. No. Uh, here we go. Try again. Everybody else get a second shot at it. <laughs> Usually I do that, and then I show you the answer. So I'll give you the 30 seconds on this one. Yeah. All right. So what's the consensus? Okay, just what we are just saying. Give yourself a round of applause and figure that one out. <laughs> okay. Yes. So these um, these immortalized cell lines, like the T line, there's the there's no effect with just cell replicating and dividing again and again on the telomere length since cell replication. I'm not sure how much of that's been looked at. These these immortalized cell lines, especially the cancer cells, like the HeLa cells and such. When you start looking at they have really screwed up karyotypes. There's all sorts of genetic aberrations with them. So I'm not even sure I believe what I was looking at. I mean, they used them so much for all these experiments. It makes me wonder if the fact that they, these cells originated decades ago, if that has any effect on them. Okay. This is, this, okay, so the point was, the question was, 
What about these cancer cells, like HeLa cells that have been used in culture for decades? Um, in fact, some people believe the HeLa cells, uh, which are a cervical carcinoma cell line that's, I think, it dates back to the 1950s or something like that. I mean, some investigators think that every cell culture out there is contaminated with them because they've been used so extensively. But these tumor cells, these cancer cells, what's growing in the petri in the tissue culture flask is not what's happening in vivo. These cells have really bizarre karyotypes and such to them, but they were the best thing you could work with. So as knockout mice became more available, that is, to be able to selectively knock, we'll talk about how to do this later on, we could selectively knock out a particular gene, then the question was, okay, now that we can do this, you spent your entire career and you're convinced that gene X plays this critical role in, in breast cancer, so now, by that argument, if I knock this gene out of this mouse, that mouse should have an increased risk for breast cancer, and you do that and you find out nothing happens. And that's because in vivo, the animal has all these other homeostatic mechanisms, backdoor biochemical pathways, alternate biochemical pathways that just don't exist in the tissue culture cells. But it was the best that was available to work with. So we really want the in vivo models as much as you can. Um, and so now the mouse genetics is getting very, very good. So I think over time you're going to see a move away from the tissue culture systems to the intact animals. Is there a question? Okay. So that's the end of chapter 12. So chapter 13 is on transcription. So by, so let's see, some of the terms that I might use interchangeably. If I say a transcript, that's an RNA molecule. Usually it's going to be a messenger RNA. So you can talk about a transcription unit. When we talk about that, that's going to be a DNA sequence that's transcribed. Um, the other is, I haven't ever quite figured out why the author put mushrooms on the... The only reason I could think of for putting mushrooms on the cover is that some of the really, really very dangerous and potent inhibitors of RNA transcription that you can use in the lab and tissue culture cells and such come from mushrooms. So some of the really toxic chemicals to block protein synthesis, to block DNA replication, all of this, all these compounds, a lot of them come from mushrooms. So I love mushrooms, but I buy them from a store. So if something happens to me, I want my family to be able to sue somebody <laughs> rather than someone just saying, can't believe you're so stupid. He ate those mushrooms that he found out in the, you know, out, I don't know, when I was in California, I had a, there was a grad student in the lab, and I guess her and her family were really into the mushrooms, and they'd go out, but you better know what, you better know what you're doing, or you're not going to be able to tell anybody. Okay. Hmm? They can mutate at any time and look exactly the same as they did. Oh, I know. Yeah. No, they make some make some really good drugs. <laughs> really dangerous. But they work well in the lab. Okay. So we're talking about transcription. So we talked about DNA replication, replicating the DNA. Now we've got this other area of DNA metabolism, and that is one of its major functions is the DNA is the repository of the genetic information. These transcripts are going to be a template. They're going to be a molecule that can transfer that information from the nucleus to wherever it's needed. So in most cases, that'll be the messenger RNA. That's going to encode the information. That's going to tell the ribosomes how to make the protein. So let's just kind of get started with this. So just like DNA, RNA is a polymer. It's just going to be repeating nucleotides, except now they're the ribonucleotides instead of the deoxyribonucleotides. Uh, they're very similar to DNA, in a couple, except for a couple of key things. Uh, one area where they are similar, it's the same phosphodiester bond. So the same chemical bond joins the ribonucleotides together as it occurs with the deoxyribonucleotides. Uh, so as we've talked about before, obviously it's the ribonucleotides 
which are really distinguished by the fact that they have the hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon. And this does a couple of things. One is it biochemically makes RNA less stable than DNA. So in terms of working with RNA in the laboratory and such, you have to be more careful with RNA molecules. Uh, they, you can lose, and also the RNases that can degrade them are much more ubiquitous and much more robust. So there's a little more of a challenge working with RNA than DNA in the lab. We also know that RNA has uracil, whereas DNA has thymine. But as I showed you before, thymine is really 5-methyluracil. So if you just take uracil, put a methyl group on the 5-carbon, on the not the 5 prime, but the 5-carbon on the uracil group, you'll create thymine. RNA is, here's the biggest difference. In cells, RNA is typically single-stranded. DNA is double-stranded. But as we've talked about before, the RNA can take on secondary structures, these hairpin loops because of inverted repeats and such. So in many ways, like proteins, the real functionality of the RNA is going to be in its three-dimensional structure. So this is very similar to what we've seen before, where you can get all of this folding. So, for instance, here's an, the inverted repeat. Here's another inverted repeat. And it's really this secondary structure that gives it its, its functionality. So this goes back to the same recurring theme, that the structure dictates the function. And so DNA really can't take on a wide range of shapes because it's constrained by this double-stranded structure that it has. So primarily, the, its information content, its job is to store information, and it's the sequence of the nucleotides. Whereas with the RNA, it's really going to be the structure that that molecule takes on um, because of the sequences that allow these hairpin loops and such. So it's really, the, again, it's just these secondary structures. All right. The other is we have a whole range of classes of RNA. It's like new ones are being found almost every week now. The major ones, the ones you should already know about, is ribosomal RNA, typically shorthand as rRNA. Okay. So what's the most abundant RNA in a cell? If I isolate, if I just take some, I like my vampire bat. So I got vampire bats in tissue culture, and I isolate RNA from those cells. What's going to be the most abundant RNA I'm going to isolate? Hmm? Yeah, it's kind of a setup, wasn't it? Yeah. For most cells, probably about 95 to 98 percent of all the RNA in the cell is going to be ribosomal RNA. Cells have to make a lot of protein. They have to have a lot of ribosomes. And so the, the vast majority of the RNA will be ribosomal RNA. The messenger RNA is the one that we'll spend the most time on, the one that's most interesting, because it carries the information to direct the synthesis of the proteins. Okay. In prokaryotic cells, it's pretty straightforward. The RNA, the messenger RNA is made, and it's immediately ready to be used for translation. And since you don't have compartmentalization in prokaryotic cells, you actually have the ribosomes getting onto the messenger RNA and making the protein before transcription is even completed. In eukaryotic cells, of course, it's got to be much more complicated. In, in eukaryotic cells, transcription occurs where? In the nucleus. Okay. And protein synthesis occurs in the, in the cytoplasm. So you make the messenger RNA in the nucleus, and it's got to be transported to the cytoplasm. However, you have to first make a pre-mRNA, because you should already know eukaryotic cells have introns and exons. There is a special guanine nucleotide cap that goes on the 5' end. There's a poly A tail that goes on the 3' end. Then all the introns have to be spliced out. And everything, all the exons have to be joined together. Then it can be transported out into the cytoplasm. Then the cell can make the protein. So that'll be part of a whole other chapter. 
So the processing is in eukaryotic mRNA is rather a little is a lot more complex. So we got messenger ribosomal RNA, messenger RNA, the transfer RNAs or the tRNAs. What do they do? They transfer RNAs. What do they do? What's attached to the three prime end of the tRNA? You know, my colleagues tell me, why do we talk about this, you know, in these classes? Because you guys have already gotten it in general biology. Because <laughs> you need it again. Right? So the transfer RNA is what brings the amino acid to the codon. So you're going to have the messenger RNA, the ribosome is coming along. The tRNA has the amino acid on it. You have the codon and the anticodon, they're matching up. So it's the tRNA is really it's an adapter molecule because it's matching the amino acid to the right codon on the messenger RNA. Okay? If you don't remember all that, we're going to go into it in painful detail later. Okay. Ones you might not have heard about, there are small nuclear RNAs, which are located where? Good, good, good. All right. But they're more complicated. They're actually part of a protein complex that makes up something called the spliceosome, which is involved in processing. So this is an organelle about the size of a ribosome, but it's actually in the nucleus. So these are small nuclear ribonucleoproteins, which simply mean that they are protein RNA complexes. So they're sometimes called SNRNPs or SNRPs. All right. SNORNAs are actually in the nucleolus. So these are small RNAs in the nucleolus. What happens in the nucleolus? Where the ribosomal RNAs are assembled, right? The ribosome. Then there are small cytoplasmic RNAs, which are found in the cytoplasm. All right. MicroRNAs, small interfering. What's really happened over the last probably 10, 15 years is this whole range of small RNAs that have been discovered. They're involved in gene regulation. Um, one of them that's really important is involved in RNA interference and some of the current technology. As we've talked about, the so-called junk DNA that used to be what we thought about in the human genome. Looks like it probably codes for about 4 million new little small microRNAs. So there's an incredible array of these small RNAs. And collectively, we're just beginning to learn what they're doing. Okay? We don't understand them in anywhere near the detail that we do for ribosomal RNAs, tRNAs. The ones that you, those first, those three major ones, the tRNAs, the messenger RNA, and the ribosomal RNA. But it's important to realize there's a lot more variety of RNAs in, the, in cells and just those three types. Okay, let's try this question. I'll go to one minute since we got most of the answers. <laughs> so the answer is what? Okay. Any questions? Okay. So if we look overall at the process of transcription, 
In many ways, it's going to be similar to DNA synthesis. There's going to be an RNA polymerase instead of a DNA polymerase. But it also varies in a couple of key ways. All right. First of all, the RNA molecules are much shorter. So, and typically might be in the range of thousands of nucleotides instead of millions of nucleotides. Also, transcription is a highly regulated process. So, especially in eukaryotic cells. That's why this idea that if all these little microRNAs that are part of the junk, well, what was now the dark matter of the human genome, suggests that maybe 95 to 98 percent of our genome is used to regulate the expression of the other two to five percent. So transcription is carefully regulated. It's cell type specific, developmental stage specific. Um, many of the oncogenes, well, we now know the oncogenes, the cancer genes, are normal cellular genes, but for various reasons, they end up being, those proteins get expressed at the wrong time, in the wrong place, in the wrong tissues, and this ends up leading to some cancer situations. Also, in higher eukaryotes, as we've said now a number of times, only a very small portion of the, all of the DNA actually ever gets transcribed into RNA. Okay, so here's the three major components. So just, we have to have a DNA template. So these RNA polymerases would be a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That means it's going to make RNA using DNA as a template. You have the ribonucleotides instead of the deoxyribonucleotides, but a lot of times the R is missing, so it would just be NTP. Right. And we're going to use an RNA polymerase. You can visualize transcription in the electron micrograph. These have been called lamp rush chromosomes, Christmas trees. They go by different names. It's basically areas where ribosomal RNA synthesis is going on at a very, very high rate. So this little thin strand in the center is the DNA, and all of these little branches coming off of this tree, those are the RNA molecules. Okay. Oh, good. Now... Okay, so I know we're getting towards the end here, but stick with me because this is, gets a little confusing. You're going to have two strands of DNA, but at any given time, only one is going to be transcribed. So we've got some terminology that we have to deal with so we know which of those two strands we're talking about. So the DNA strand used for transcription is going to be called the template strand. Keep in mind... RNA synthesis, just like DNA synthesis, is going to be anti-parallel. So one strand is going to be used as a template. The opposite synthesis is going to go, and RNA polymerases, at least makes it easier for you, the RNA polymerases also only go 5 prime to 3 prime. So we're going to have the template strand. That's the actual strand of DNA that the RNA polymerase is reading and adding the complementary bases. The other strand would be the non-tank. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. So here's our two strands. This is the template strand. So this is the actual strand that the RNA polymerase is reading, and it's putting in the complementary base. Synthesis of the RNA is going 5 prime to 3 prime, just like it did with DNA. And so this is the template strand because that's actually being used by the polymerase. The non-template strand is what we call the sense strand or the plus strand. The sense strand gets its name because, the way I think about it, is it makes sense to us in the sense that this sequence is going, of the DNA is going to be exactly the same as the RNA sequence, except it's going to have a T instead of a U. So when we work with these in the lab, we're going to be looking at the sense strand because that can immediately tell us what the RNA sequence is. So it makes sense to us. 
but it's the opposite strand, the nonsense strand, or the minus strand, is the actual strand being used by the polymerase to find the complementary bases and put them together. Okay? Now, to switch it up a little bit, so as I said, you got two strands, so here's gene A, gene B, and gene C. Only one of the two strands will be transcribed for any given gene, but it doesn't have to always be on the same strand. So the way this is drawn, and it's, in this case, um, I would ignore this plus and minus because they've made things a little bit, I think it's a little confusing. This little arrow, the way this is drawn, this is a convention. When you see the little arrows pointing this way, this is showing you where transcription starts and the direction of synthesis. So for gene A, is this, this, is this, this, let's just use sense and nonsense. Is this lower strand the sense or nonsense strand? Right. Because the top strand, and look at the polarity. The sense strand is going to have to be, it goes in the same direction as the RNA synthesis, and it's going to have to go 5 prime to 3 prime. So for gene A and gene C, the lower strand is the nonsense strand, the template strand. The upper strand is the sense strand. And so the sequence of the upper sequence of this upper strand will be exactly the same as the RNA, except there'll be a T instead of a U. But over here with gene B, it's the opposite. Here, gene B is transcribed right to left. So the lower strand is now the sense strand going 5 prime to 3 prime, and the upper strand is the template or nonsense strand. Again? Okay. We've got three genes. Each gene is only going to be transcribed off of one strand, but you don't have to use, but they are not all on the same strand. In this case, Gene A and gene C are both transcribed in the same direction. So this little arrow that's pointing to the right, that indicates where transcription starts in the direction of synthesis. So this is telling me that gene A and gene C are transcribed left to right as this is drawn. Then if this is the three prime end, an RNA synthesis goes 5 prime to 3 prime, just like DNA. This lower strand has to be the template or nonsense strand. The opposite strand is the sense strand, because if I compare this sequence to the RNA, it will be exactly the same. It will make sense if I just substitute a T for a U. So A and C work the same way, but B is on the opposite strand. It gets transcribed. Transcription starts here and goes right to left. So now the 5 prime to 3 prime, so the lower strand is the one that's going in the same direction. So it will be the sense strand. And if I, see, if I get the sequence from right to left of this lower strand, it's going to be identical to the RNA except for the T's and U's. And the upper strand, which is now 3 prime to 5 prime right to left, will be the template strand. Yes? I think what they're trying, I'm not sure why they, this is sometimes used, and sometimes these are called like the Watson and Crick strands, just to give you some point of reference. But I think it's confusing um, because, let's see if it, because you're talking here about the template and the, and the it's because I, it could be a different way that I'm using it. What I'm telling you is a very conventional way of using the plus and minus. Here, so here, they've used it trying to, I think they're trying to distinguish the two strands, but I think it's confusing. If you were to subset, if you, some people used to call these the Watson and Crick strands. 
So change the negative to a W and change the plus to a C, then, then you can plug it in here and it's telling you it's correct. Or just ignore it. So what you want to be looking for is when you know the direction of transcription, the sense strand is going to have to be the strand that goes in the same five prime to three prime direction. And the template is just going to be the other strand. But the important point being that sometimes the gene, you, you, don't, you don't know ahead of time until you do the analysis. You don't know really which way the system is transcribed. And we'll talk later next time about where the promoters are and how the whole system knows. Am I going left or right? Which way am I going? That's all dictated by the promoter. Okay. Can I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, if you need to, just ignore the plus and minus on this side. Okay, so um, I think, yeah, so this is a good place to start, cause, or stop, <laughs> a good place to start. All right, so what's today, Wednesday?